I would like to thank Dr. Hillary Clayton for joining us today. Dr. Clayton is a veterinarian, researcher, and horsewoman. For the past 40 years, she has been conducting amazing research in the areas of equine biomechanics and conditioning programs for equine athletes. Dr. Clayton has also been a guest speaker in Equine Guelph's online course offerings, and she is with us today to answer some of your questions on equine conditioning and fitness. Welcome, Dr. Clayton. And thank you for inviting me. To start us off today, Dr. Clayton, what is the difference between conditioning and training? I regard training as being the technical preparation of the athlete. So it teaches the horse the skills of the support sport, whether it's doing a half pass, a sliding stop, jumping a fence. And these are the things that trainers in general are experts themselves at. Now conditioning has to back up the training program by strengthening the horse, making him fitter so that he can actually perform to his maximum capacity. And at the same time, while making that maximum performance, the horse's body has to be prepared to withstand it. We don't want our horses breaking down. So conditioning has the dual objectives of maximizing performance and maintaining soundness. Now, ideally, although I talk about these as two sort of separate areas, what we would like to do is be able to integrate the movements of the training program and use those to condition the horse very specifically for the sport that he's going to be competing in. And uh, what are some considerations for horses that go from full work to just pasture turnout? Because indeed that's the case at the moment right now for a lot of horses and it's not been due to injury or health concerns. Yes, and that's sort of one of the bad things that's happened at the moment that's totally outside our control. Ideally, if we were um, roughing a horse off, we would gradually decrease the amount of exercise from full work um, down to fewer days a week, less intensive training, and maybe in the ideal world, keep the horse working two or three days a week just lightly so that he didn't completely lose condition. And then we also have to consider that as the workload decreases, we have to decrease things like the food, the diet that the horse is eating. And of course, these days, a lot of owners don't have any opportunity to even visit their horses, let alone um, you know, actively change their exercise program and their diet. So, as I say, this is far from ideal, but luckily most of our horses are fairly resilient and you know most of them will cope with that uh i would probably just um finish up by saying that our golden rule always with the horses is not to change things suddenly and that's been imposed on us we have to make the best of it that we can and, and we all know that humans lose their fitness level pretty quickly without regular exercises. How long is it before horses begin to lose muscle mass and fitness? Yeah, well, we're a little bit lucky there in that our horses are able to maintain condition a bit better than people are. Horses as a species have an enormously high cardiovascular capacity, way, way higher than even the fittest human athlete. So given that large capacity, they're also retaining at least an adequate um, cardiovascular ability for longer than people. So a horse for about a week is not losing, uh, sorry, about a month, is not really losing cardiovascular ability. When we get out beyond a month, which is certainly the case with the COVID restrictions, then yes, horses do lose cardiovascular capacity, and they're also going to lose muscular strength. And both of those are important components of the horse's competitive ability. What about bone and connective tissues? Yes, well, the whole musculoskeletal system, which includes the bones that are the sort of framework, the muscles that are moving the bones and the tendons connecting the muscles to the joints, and then the ligaments that are stabilizing the joints, and the joints themselves with the articular cartilage, the joint capsule, all of those tissues are sensitive to the amount and the type of work, and they adapt um, in accordance with the work that the horse is doing. 
Now, there are some important differences between those tissues, though. Bones and muscles are able to respond throughout the horse's lifetime. So if workload decreases, then the bones become a little weaker, the muscles become smaller, they um, atrophy a little bit, they're less capable of prolonged, as in endurance type, work um, and they, they become less strong but the good thing with bones and muscles is that when the horse starts exercising again then they're able to come back to their former capacity now the ligaments tendons and articular cartilage are maybe a different story those tissues mature very early in the horse's life before the horse is two years old and beyond that age they have limited capacity to adapt to work. So what we like is to have a foal that goes out and runs around you know, during the first two years of his life and develops a very strong, resilient musculoskeletal system and then hopefully retains that for his lifetime. Uh, foals that don't get out as babies, it's not possible as far as we know to compensate for that later in the horse's life. And there's also a lot that we don't know about how ligaments, tendons, joint cartilage respond to changes in the exercise level. So that's a little bit of an unknown. And those are the tissues that really affect the quality that I would call resilience in our equine athletes. Okay, so resilience I define as being the ability to stand up to the performances. Sounds like we're going to have to do a bit of work when we uh, reintroduce our horses back into training. Um, yes, we are. <laughs> so if they've been out for a few months, um, where do you start and how do you know when to move forward? Okay, how do you start? That's the easy part to answer. You start very, very gradually. And I think even before you can start working the horse, you have to pay attention to things like the horse's feet. Has the farrier been able to visit the farm or have the horse's feet been unattended for several months? And if the latter is the case, then it may take more than one trimming or shoeing cycle to get the feet back into good shape. And like all other parts of the horse's body, the hooves respond to the type and amount of exercise. So. We have to pay attention to the feet. We have to pay attention to whether the saddle still fits because the horses are going to have lost muscle mass. The shape of their back has probably changed and they may well need either to wear a, a sheepskin pad for a while that kind of takes up the, the space and lets the muscles move underneath it or they may need shims or they may need to have the saddle reflocked periodically until they get their normal shape back. So there are things like that that are just plain good horsemanship that we have to attend to. We're going to have to think about the horse's diet as they start to go back to work, changing from a mainly forage diet, hopefully, to a little bit more high energy food if they need it. And the next thing is that the actual work, which is what you really want to hear about probably, we, we should start very, very gradually. You know, think of it that the horse, all his body, his feet, his back, his skin, everything needs a, a little bit of time to sort of harden off and get used to carrying the saddle to actually working, doing physical exercise again. So I like to think of a period of two to four weeks, depending on how long the horse has been off, that he's going to have to do just really slow work at the walk. So I would start off with about 10 minutes of walking a day under saddle and doing that probably three or four days a week. Increase the amount of walking by 10 minutes per week. So by the time you're three weeks out, you're doing about half an hour of walking a day. And then assuming everything's going well, that's when I would introduce a bit of trotting, a couple of minutes into each workout, but not all in one go, maybe break it up into sort of 20 second segments and then increasing the amount of trotting introducing cantering a couple of minutes a week increase in trot or canter and the other thing that will help to um, strengthen the muscles get the horse fitter quicker is to do lots of transitions right there's some benefit from doing 
um, longer periods of trot or longer periods of cantering, but there's also a lot of benefit to be obtained by doing correct transitions between the gates. All right, fantastic. Sounds like we're going to all need to be patient when we get our horses back so, to work. I think that word patient is very important here. We have no idea at the moment how long the horses are going to be off. Mm -hmm. And the longer they're off, the more important it is to start them slowly. And you know, I understand that if you haven't ridden for three or four or six months, you want to jump back on and have a good ride and enjoy it. But unfortunately, that's not going to be the best thing for the horses. And we have to you know, kind of slow down and put the horse first. Good advice. Uh, what are the signs then of too fast, too long or too soon? And how can we avoid this? Well, in general, there can be lots of signs. You know, the horse may get back pain. Uh, it's probably more likely to have limb pain. And then you may see the classical signs of inflammation. There may be swelling, heat, pain. And if there's pain, then the horse will be lame. Lameness um, can be anything from a very mild lameness in which the horse might just be reluctant to go forward or his gaits may lose quality or it could progress to be an actual observable clinical lameness. So I think you, each person knows their own horse better than anybody else, and we're the ones that are responsible for detecting changes, monitoring changes, and staying very aware of all the possibilities of things to go wrong. And I I take it there's going to be a lot of riders saying, oh, but my horse feels great. It's full of energy. Why can't I just let him go? Have a run. Now, what you're describing is one of the um, oh, major ways that our horses fool us. When we start working them again, they develop cardiovascular fitness very, very quickly. Quicker than the muscles develop strength and quicker than we think the other tissues come back into um, kind of full ability to support the horse. So once the horse starts to get a little bit cardiovascularly fit, he feels really good. So he comes out and he's fresh and he's frisky and he wants to work. And then the danger is that we think, oh yes, I could just do a bit more. He feels really good. But that's actually the moment when we should say, okay, I know I've done what I'm supposed to do today. We have to stop here. Don't let the horse dictate how much work you'll do. The horse will, like the endurance horses, will run themselves into the ground until they die. Right? So it's our responsibility always to take charge of how much work we let the horses do. Fantastic. So just addressing some of the different disciplines, uh, you've ridden quite a few different disciplines in your time. Can you tell us um, some of the similarities and differences in training programs that you would do for different disciplines? Yeah. So when I start a horse or when a horse is coming back after a long layoff, as we're talking about now, then I think of the initial phase of conditioning as being rather generalized. Right, the horse has to develop a better aerobic capacity. He has to strengthen the muscles in a fairly general way. So to me, the first, oh, probably two to three months are what I call general conditioning. Beyond that, we look at what direction the horse is going. What sport is he being targeted towards? Because there is a huge difference in preparing a horse to do a 100-mile endurance ride or to go around a cross-country course versus a horse that's just going to do a rail class or a low-level dressage test. So yeah, we look at the sport after we've established a baseline level of fitness and we decide first, is this going to be an endurance type sport, which would include endurance ra racing, competitive trail, eventing, combined driving, those types of sports we classify as endurance sports. And for those sports, we would first look at building up the horse's endurance by increasing the duration of the workouts. And then when the endurance has reached an appropriate level, we look at how much high intensity work is involved in the sport. So um, a three-day event horse would have 
a higher call for intensity than say a 100 mile endurance horse. There are just some differences within the endurance sports when you get to the higher levels. Now, other sports require um, not a particularly high level of cardiovascular fitness, but they may require a lot of muscular strength. So dressage would come into that category. So those horses were going to be maintaining cardiovascular fitness, but doing very targeted exercises, often involving the movements of the sport to enhance the horse's muscular strength. And then we have jumping, which is a little different again in that high level show jumpers work at enormously high heart rates because they have to use a whole lot of energy every time they take off or land over a fence. So a show jumper going around a course at a speed of let's say 350 meters a minute would have a heart rate similar to a horse galloping at 650 meters a minute. So you know we can't underestimate the energy required to actually get over those big fences. So jumpers would need um, more high intensity work doing things like plyometrics, short sprints, um, gymnastic jumping, that kind of thing. Interesting. What advice do you have to horse owners that are worried that leaving their horse alone at this time is detrimental to its well-being? Well, I guess we have to define detrimental to its well-being. Um, obviously, there are plenty of horses in the world that live out completely naturally and they do just fine. That's not the standard of care that we expect for our top competition horses. Although, you know, if I'm really honest, I think the pendulum has swung a long, long way from the natural lifestyle that horses were bred to. Um, to live in. So we do coddle our horses, we keep them in stalls, that kind of thing. I would like to see more turnout, I would like to see high forage diets, those sort of things to me are much better for the horse's well-being than the way we sometimes keep them. Um, but having said that, I mean, what do horses really need? They need water, they need food, they need shelter. And as long as we can provide that and have somebody check on them a couple of times a day to make sure they're and are still functional, not lame, not col colicking, that kind of thing, then I think that most horses will be fine. Mm 